Hey, how's everybody doing? It's Todd from All Music, and welcome to 1979. Today is the top 10 special edition of the best top albums, my pick, anyways. What I think is the best albums of 1979. Uh, we're going to do the top 10 today, um, and we're going to get right into it because uh, I, w I don't want to make this as long as uh, as it could possibly be. Uh, so let's let's get right into my number 10 album of 1979 and my favorite i mean this list is is uh i had a lot to choose from okay so uh it's pretty hard to to make a list of your favorites but as of uh today and from what you know how i've gone through it and i've you know some fell off some some jumped on you know the top 10 uh, i could easily do a top 20 easily no problem um, but we're going to get right into the top 10 special edition of my favorite albums of 1979. And we're going to go ahead and uh, start with number 10, like I said. And it is... Tom Petty. Let's see. Here it is. Damn the Torpedoes. Yeah, so Tom Petty, Damn the Torpedoes is uh, a, an amazing album. I mean, look at what we got here. Uh, Refugee, Here Comes My Girl, Even the Losers, Shadow of a Doubt. All of those songs were on the radio. Century City, uh, Don't Do Me Like That, still on the radio still. Uh, uh, you Tell Me, What Are You Doing in My Life in Louisiana Rain. These are all really, really amazing albums. And uh, I think everybody at the time was just really into Tom Petty. Uh, super great, super great stuff. Um, let's see if I can find a little something on uh, Wikipedia about Tom Petty and this particular album. And we just won't get into a lot of it, but uh, just a little bit of what he was up to. Yeah, so uh, Tom Petty in 1979 released uh, Damn, the Torpedo, Damn the Torpedoes. That was his third album for... Uh, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. That was released in 1979 on October 19th, and it was the first. It was the first of three Petty albums originally released by the Backstreet Record label, distributed by MCA. It built on the commercial success of uh, and critical acclaim of the two previous albums that reached number two on the Billboard charts. The album went on to become certified triple platinum. Uh, so that's pretty darn cool. Um, you got Tom Petty on lead vocals and Mike Campbell on guitars and rhythm guitars, lead guitars, keyboards. Uh, ben Montench uh, on uh, keyboards and backing vocals. Ron Blair on bass guitar and Stan Lynch on drums. Super, super great album. Um, Love that one a lot. And um, I listened to it a lot. I mean, it was, I mean, you could not listen to it. Um, it was on the radio constantly. I mean, I, every, every day. You would hear back in those days, you would hear um, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. I mean, it was just, it was just constant. Let's see. All right, let's move on to um, my number nine pick of the uh, year, 1979. And with that, we're gonna go with uh, one of my favorite bands at the time, Foreigner. Head Games. Really liked this album. Um, it came on pretty strong with Dirty White Boy and Love on the Telephone and Woman, um, I'll Get Even With You, 17, Head Games. I used to play Head Games in a band. Uh, the Modern Day, I like that song. Blinded by Science is cool. A lot of, even the deeper cuts, Rev on the Red Line, is a really, really cool song. Uh, Do What You Like and Azalea. Those are all really cool songs. Um, the deep cuts that you might not have heard if you didn't have this album or listened to it are really good songs. Um, that's part of the reason why I like Foreigner because even though, you know, like Cold as Ice and Feels Like the First Time and all, and some of those songs were, were great radio hits, but, but they were, um, but the albums had deep cuts that were really good as well. So, um, which kind of goes, uh, with most of these bands that I have on my top 10, um, for sure, because, uh, that's why I like them because because uh, a lot of times I like the deep cuts more than I actually like some of the hits, uh, for sure. Uh, in most in most records, you know, uh, you know, I don't really like to let people decide what I like. I just like to like what I like, and 
and that's why I go with some deep cuts. But let's see what we got about head games here. This was the third studio album by the British American rock band Foreigner. It was released September 10th, 1979 by Atlantic Records. Uh, recorded at Atlantic Studio in New York with additional recording and whole mixing taking place at Cherokee Studios in Los Angeles. It was the only Foreigner album co-produced by Roy Thomas Baker, best known for working with Queen's classic albums, and it marked the first appearance of the new bass, gu uh, bass, guitar, uh, bass guitarist uh, Rick Willis. Uh, he was from the Small Faces. And, um, yeah, really cool. Um, let's see, in August 1979, the release of the album was preceded by its first single, The Thunderous Hard Rocking Dirty White Boy, uh, which peaked at number 12 on the hot uh, the Billboard Hot 100. The album itself conti uh, continued Foreigner's popularity, climbing to number five on the Billboard 200 charts and receiving platinum cer certification uh, four months after it hit the stores. Wow. By now, Head Games has gained five times multi-platinum status for selling at least five million albums in the United States. The next singles were the title track, uh, Women, which reached number 14 and 41 respectively. So pretty cool. So you got Lou Graham on lead vocals, Mick Jones on guitars, and, and lead vocals too. Ian McDonald on guitars, keyboards, vocals, Al Greenwood keyboards, Dennis Elliott drums, and Rick Willis on guitars. Or, uh, Rick Willis was, uh, uh, yeah, bass, guitars, and vocals. Yeah, great band for sure, um, especially back then at that point. And they're still a great band. Um, sadly, Lou Graham had got, I think, cancer. Um, you know, in his vocal cords or something like that, you know, that, that pretty much took him out of the band and really couldn't sing much. Um, he did have a little bit of solo success before all that went down. Um, but uh, they have a, they're still, they're still performing today and they have a great new singer. He's really good. He sounds a, a, kind of like Lou Graham in a way, or at least he can sound like it. Uh, they've had a few singers over the years, actually. Um, but this one they have now has been with them for quite a long time, I think over a decade. And uh, I actually seen a concert recently with uh, them performing, and Lou Graham was performing with the other lead singer as well. So that was really cool. He can't quite sing as well as he used to, but he certainly, uh, you know, you could tell was, was thankful that he was able to participate in that way and be part of the band and, and still do all that. So let's see. That was number nine, Foreigner Head Games. So let's move on to number eight. And number eight for me in the year 1979 on my top 10 is Journey. Interesting album from Journey. This is the Evolution album. 1979 had some pretty great hits. This is where Steve Perry really pretty much took over the band as lead vocalist. Greg Raleigh was the lead vocalist up to that point, and he actually still does some lead vocal singing on this album. But Steve Perry pretty much took over at this point, and uh, which also kind of led to Greg Raleigh leaving. Um, and that's when Jonathan Cain came from the babies and joined the band. And, um, you know, sh shortly after that, they became huge, huge. But they were doing pretty good at this point. Uh, they got, uh, they had some hits off this album. Uh, they got Majestic, Too Late, Love and Touch and Squeezin'. That was a big, that was a big hit. Uh, uh, City of the Angels, oh, that was a good song. Uh, when You're Alone, uh, Sweet and Simple. Loving You Isn't Easy, um, Just the Same Way, that's a good song, and that was played a lot on the radio, and that was one of the songs that had Greg Raleigh, the keyboard player, singing lead vocals, um, and then on the verses, and then the chorus would, um, uh, you know, Steve Perry would come in with that, with his voice, so pretty cool. Um, and then you got uh, Do You Recall, Daydream, and Lucky Lady. Uh, up to that, you know, before this, you know, Journey was kind of a jazz fusion rock instrumental type group, you know. Um, I, I had some of their earlier records. Like I do, I, I find a band I like and then I go see what else they already have. Quite different from what Journey became, that's for sure. Um, but uh, I liked that music and I've actually gone back and listened to some of it recently. Um and it was it was it's it's good. I like it, and I, I remember it because I used to listen to it a lot. Um, it's just not what what we know as Journey today. Uh, let's see uh, if I can find anything on them. Yeah, 
think I got something here. So evolution is, uh, it's the fifth studio album by Journey released in March 1979 on Columbia Records. It was the first album to feature drummer Steve Smith. Um, it was the band's most successful album at the time, selling 3 million copies in the U.S. and charting at number 20 on the Billboard charts. Um, let's see, they retained uh, Roy Thomas Baker, best known for his work with Queen as a producer. But Ansley Dunbar was replaced with Steve Smith, formerly from Ronnie Montrose. Uh, Evolution featured their top 20 hit, Loving, Touching, Squeezing, which was inspired by the classic Sam Cooke top 20 hit, Nothing can change this love and reach number 16 on the US uh, just the same way featured the original lead, guitar, uh, lead vocalist Greg Raleigh along with Steve Perry yeah so we talked about that a little bit so you got now in the band you got Steve Perry on lead vocals Neil Schoen electric acoustic backing vocals guitar synthesizer Greg Raleigh on keyboards backing vocals and co-lead vocals Ross Valerie on backing or on bass guitar and backing vocals and bass pedals and Steve Smith with drums, percussions, and uh, uh, some vocals as well. Uh, yeah, so pretty good album. Um, definitely uh, they reached new heights soon after this. Well, that is a fact. Um, that's, but uh, I still enjoyed it, and I, we even jammed some of those songs back, the, back in the day, uh, like Love and Touch and Squeeze, and we fooled around with it for a little while. Um, but I, we didn't really do it because I was a singer at the time for that band, and I just couldn't hit those high notes that Steve Perry was hitting. So that that never really went anywhere. All right, so that brings us to number seven on my top ten of 1979 album releases, at least my favorite top ten, not yours perhaps. I mean, I want to know what you think. I mean, you may rank these different. You might like some of these, and you might have listened to them back then, um, or you might be listening to, to them now if they're still your favorites, but let me know what your favorites are. You know, uh, give me a list or rate them in the way you want to. I'd be interested in knowing how you feel about these. Um, but let's take a look at, uh, number seven. Now this is kind of an interesting band, uh, the kinks. Now, I don't know how many of you guys listened to this album at the time because it really, it did pretty well as an album, but it really didn't have any uh, super major hits, you know, and definitely you got so a little bit of airplay, but it wasn't huge as far as singles, but it was a, it did pretty well as an album. This is the Kinks low budget attitude. Catch me now I'm falling. It's a cool song. It kind of has a riff that sounds a little bit at times at, at certain parts of the song. It sounds a little bit like satisfaction from the Rolling Stones. Pressure, uh, National Health, I uh, Wish I Could Fly Like Superman. I think that was probably their biggest uh, chart-topping song from this album. Low Budget, In Space, A Little Bit of Emotion, Gallon of Gas, Misery, and Moving Pictures. This is a pretty rocking album, really, for the Kinks. This is sort of uh, some pretty good rock and roll, uh, actually. Um, not so much sort of 60s or any kind of psychedelic or like Lola or anything like that. Definitely, um, definitely a rock album. It, it, it's got some crunching guitar on it and uh, I liked it a lot. I used to listen to it quite a bit. Let's see if we can find anything um, on this album on Wikipedia. Look around a little bit. For the kinks. Let's see, where is the kinks? Do they have anything for me? Uh, let's see what's on here. Might give us a little information. Yeah, okay, so yeah, the low budget is the 18th studio album. Wow, that's a shocker. 18, that's just their 18th, and this was 1979, and this was their 18th studio album that's crazy by the english rock group the kinks released in 1979 the following their minor success of their 1978 album uh, misfits the band recorded the majority of this album in new york rather than london unlike the more nostalgic themes of many of the kinks albums prior to low budget the album contained more songs that appealed to current events of the time 
Musically, the album is a continuation of the band's arena rock phase. Yeah, that's what it was. So yeah, kind of it was way more rocky than some of their other stuff. But they had a period that they were doing like that kind of stuff. So like this says, it was kind of a continuation of that style of music form, and it resulted in more of a rock-based sound and more modern production techniques. And despite being a relative failure in the UK, Low Budget was a great success for the group in both the US uh, and a group in US, both critically and commercially, not only becoming their best selling non compilation album, um, but also peaking at number 11 on the American charts. Uh, the lead single, Wish I Could Fly Like Superman, was also a minor hit in the US, reaching number 41. So, yeah, not a lot of, uh, not a lot of radio play, although you do hear uh, I Can Fly Like Superman. I've heard Pressure and I've heard Catch Me Now I'm Falling a little bit once in a while on the radio, even still today. So you got uh, Ray Davies on guitar and keyboards and vocals, and you got Dave Davies, guitar, background vocals, uh, Jim Rodford on bass, guitar, and vocals, and Mick Avery on drums. So that's the Kinks, low budget. Really like them. Uh, this was, for some reason, I wasn't a big Kinks fan. You know, I, mean, I like their hits that I heard, uh, you know, before that. Um, but, you know, I was never a huge Kinks fan. And I never really got into any other albums of theirs. Uh, but I did like this one a lot. Uh, and I listened to, to it many times and still lands here on number, number seven on my top ten list for 1979. All right, let's go to, all right, now we're at number six. So usually I do the top six picks. And since this is a special edition, I'm doing ten. It's a good thing because there's a lot to choose from. It was hard to kind of pick. Uh, only 10. I could have done top 20 easy uh, for this. Uh, maybe I'll do like a top 20 of the decade or something like that uh, after I finish getting through all the years. But um, let's move to number six. And my number six was uh, a band that I was really into before this album came out, Breakfast of America, Breakfast in America by Supertramp. Uh, already was a fan. Uh, Love their stuff. And this album, much more poppy than uh, their previous albums, in my opinion. And I think a lot of people's opinion, but still, you know, had some proggy elements to it. But I, and even even though it had that super tramp sound and it was very appealing and did very well, um, I listened to it a lot. Gone Hollywood was the number one song or first song on the album. Logical Song was a big hit for him. Goodbye Stranger, Breakfast in America, Oh Darling, Take the Long Way Home. It's got that kind of haunting harmonica uh, opening of cool song. Uh, uh, Lord Is It Mine, Just Another Nervous Wreck, Casual Conversation, and uh, Child of Vision. Yeah, super good album, released in 1979. Um, I liked it a lot. I, I had I spent a lot of time with that album. But uh, let's see if we can find that one. What was it? Uh, oh, yeah, I was working on Super Tramp. Let's see what Super Tramp's got to say about about this whole thing any kind of indication on what was going on for them at this time so breakfast in america is the sixth studio album by english rock band super tramp released by a and m records on the 29th of march 1979 it was recorded in 78 at the village records in los angeles and it spawned four u.s billboard hit singles logical song at number six Goodbye Stranger, number 15, Take the Long Way Home, number 10, and Breakfast in America was number 62. In the UK, the logical song and the title track, which was Breakfast in America, they both uh, top uh, were both in the top 10 hits, too. The only two the group had uh, in that country were those songs. Um, they're, they were much more successful in America, it looked like. In 1980, Breakfast of in America won two Grammy Awards, including Best Engineered Non-Classical Recording. That's kind of a funny award. Um, and Grammy nominated for Best Album of the Year, Best Pop Performance by a Duo or Group with Vocals, and it holds a RIAA certification of quadruple platinum and becoming Supertram's biggest selling album with more than 4 million copies sold in the U.S., it was number one on the Billboard charts for six weeks until June 30th when it lost that number one. Uh, and then, oh, it also hit number one in um, Norway, Austria, Spain, 
Uh, Canada, Australia, and France. Very cool. Let's see. Um, I see you got Rick Davies on vocals and piano and a ton of other stuff. Uh, Roger Hodgson's vocals, electric guitar, you know, just these two guys were multi-instrumentalists. Then you got uh, John Hellwell, Halliwell, saxophone. He's a great saxophone player. I think I talked about him before. I love his contributions to this, uh, to, to uh, Super Tramp. Then you got Dougie, uh, Dougie Thomas on bass and Bob Siebenberg on drums. So very cool. Yeah, that was a big album at the uh, not only not only their biggest album, but it was a big album uh, for them as a band. Really, um, yeah, really big album. And I listened to this a lot, and I really loved like "Take the Long Way Home" was probably one of the coolest songs uh, just for that harmonica opening, you know. But uh, really liked it. All right, so that brings us to number five. Let's see what we got for number five. It's a good one. Communique. This is Dire Straits. Okay, this is before they, you know, made it huge on MTV with that song, I Want My MTV. This was the album before that, but I was way into it. My mom had their first album, and I loved it. And then when this came out, I ended up getting this and buying my own version of their first album, Dire Straits. Uh, I love Mark Knopfler as a guitar player and a songwriter. His guitar playing is quite unique and his styling is really, you know, his own styling and unique to himself. And see, when you hear his guitar, to me, you know, as a guitar player and a musician, you know, sometimes there's certain musicians that you, that I can pick out and other musicians can. It's like, you know, that's them when, when you hear them playing. And he's one of those guitarists for me. Let's see. Uh, Once Upon the uh, Time in the Wild West is a great song. News, uh, Where Do You Think You're Going, Communique, Lady Rider, which was a hit from them. Uh, Angel of Mercy, great song, part of Bella Bella. Uh, Single-Handed Sailor and Follow Me Home. Very good album. I love the feel of this album and the guitar playing, uh, the lead soloing. Very cool songwriting. Um definitely a, a favorite of mine my number five favorite of this year uh let's see what we can find for them oh is that it there yeah okay dire straits yeah the, you know like i said this was before they became mtv you know sort of famous uh communique is the second Studio album by the British rock band Dire Straits released on January 15, 1979 by Vertigo Records internationally and Warner Brothers Records in the United States and um, and Mercury Records in Canada. See, this album produced the single Lady Rider. Yeah, that's the one I said was was a hit. It was only 40, it reached number 45 on the Billboard Hot 100 chart and 51 on the UK charts. Um, let's see, the album reached number one, well, the, the album reached number one on album charts in Germany, New Zealand, Sweden, number 11 in the United States, and five in the um, United Kingdom. Communique was later certified gold in the United States, platinum in the UK, and double platinum in France. Yeah, so they were, they were an international act for sure. They were huge um, all over the world, touring all over the world. Let's see, uh, but uh, I think this is the last album with um, Mark Knopfler is the lead singer. You might, you know, know his name. Maybe you might not, but you might recognize him with the bandana and the balding head and whatnot. But he also, his brother played in the van band too, David Knopfler. And this was the last album that he played um, with, uh, with Dire Straits because I think they had a falling out. And when they were recording their next album, the, you know, I Want My MTV and all that, um, I guess he got kicked out of the band or left the band or whatever. And from what I remember back in the day, Mark Knopfler um, erased all of his tracks on that album and replaced him with his own guitar playing so he could have nothing to do with the band at that point. And he never did again, I don't think. Although I did look up David Knopfler like a couple years ago and sort of went on a little kick to see what he was doing. He was fairly prolific and he made a lot of his own albums and, uh, it was pretty good, but it wasn't anything like Dire Straits, but still, nevertheless, it was a good album. Uh, so you got John Inslee on bass guitar and vocals. Uh, David Knopfler was rhythm guitar and vocals. Mark Knopfler on vocals. 
lead guitar and rhythm guitars and Pick Withers on drums. So that was uh, Dire Straits at the time, Communique. Liked that album a lot. And I just like that sound. I mean, really, the first two albums were probably some of my favorite. Uh, I like the next album with, you know, uh, it, I Want My MTV, but I don't like all of it. And that song I don't like very much anymore. It was fun at the time, I guess, you know, you could say. But some of the songs, one of the sides on that other album, the next one, is really good. But I like this whole album, Communique, a super, super cool album. All right, so let's move to number four. Number four, if for me, in 1979 was The Police, Regatta de Blanc. This was a great album. Uh, had a huge hit with Message in the Bottle, Regatta de Blanc, uh, It's All Right for You, Bring on the Night, Death Wish, Walking on the Moon, um, On Any Other Day, The Bed's Too Big Without You, The Bed's Too Big Without You. Yeah, good song, Contact, and Does Everyone Stare. Super great album. I love this band at the time. I believe this is their second album. These dudes here, though, man, they would fight each other, like, constantly. They were they were, uh, they were, were crazy. I mean, especially the drummer. Um, he was, um, he was, like, bipolar, man, and he would just, uh, he would just fight all the time. It was kind of crazy. But uh, that really was the demise of the police, too. I think um, over time, they really, uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Yeah, it, it really was just too much. I, I, I kind of was checking them out recently, and I saw, I found some, uh, some concerts they did at like a re, uh, reunion concert in like 2007. And, uh, you know, they sounded pretty good. Uh, Andy, Andy's Summers was Sumner's or whatever his name is, you know, he was not super, uh, I think he struggled a little bit with his guitar playing, but he sounded pretty good. But, and then I heard it a later one, like the next year and it was, it was a much better mm -hmm. and he had lost a lot of weight. So he looked better, but, um, definitely, uh, definitely a volatile band when they were young and, and it was too bad because I think it pretty much broke the band up. Let's see, Regatta de Blanc is the second studio album by the English new wave band, The Police. Remember I talked about them being new wave in a previous episode of uh, All Music. But uh, that's kind of a funny term. I don't really think we use it much anymore. And I don't even know if I would consider them new wave because I think of new wave more like with like keyboards and things like that. But um, let's see, uh, they released this album on October 2nd, 1979. It was a, a band's first album to reach number one on the UK album charts and featured their first two UK hits, Message in a Bottle and Walking on the Moon. In early 1980, the album was reissued in the US with two 10 inch discs, one album per side, per disc, as well as a collector's edition and posters in the band. Let's see. It was their second album. Uh, let's see. Uh, Regatta de Blanc took four weeks to record, um, spaced over several months, Unlike its uh, successors in Yada Mandata, which I like as well, there was no pressure on the band. Um, of the session, Stuart Copeland said, we just went into the studio and said, right, who's got the first song? We hadn't even rehearsed them before we went in. And it was a piece of modern, uh, this was from a piece in Modern Drummer magazine. And Copeland rose, uh, chose Regatta de Blanc as the best police album. So he liked that album. But Stuart Copeland was he was he's a wild guy so you got staying on bass lead vocals and double bass bass synthesizer and arrangements and he also was a primary writer as well andy sumner's guitar synthesizer arrangements and Stuart copeland on drums backing vocals looks like he did some lead vocal and some arranging as well uh, great band love the police um definitely like them more than i i think i mentioned it before more than i like the um you know the career of Sting. It was, Sting's career was okay, but um, I really I thought I liked the Police more, and I too bad they couldn't you know stick it out. But I mean, I think Sting did all right for himself, and you know Stuart Copeland did all right for himself too. He definitely um, was very successful in um, like movie soundtracks and things like that. He would write, so that's good for him. All right, so now we're, we're we're moving quick. We're at the top. We're at the top three. 
So we're at number three. Uh, this is a great album. I love this album. Very fun. I played it often and loud. This is the Cars Candio. It's my number three album. It's got Let's Go, Since I Held You, It's All I Can Do, Double Live, Shooby Doo, Candio, Night Spot, uh, You Can't Hold On Too Long, Lust for Kicks, Got a Lot on My Head, and Dangerous Type. I used to play Dangerous Type in my band when I was a kid. Uh, very fun. Uh, good, good album. Really like it. Um, the, the thing with the cars is, is that, you know, um, people think of Rick Ocasek as the lead singer, but uh, Benjamin Orr was also the lead singer of the cars. And a lot of their hits were actually sung by Benjamin Orr, the bass player of the cars. And, uh, he, unfortunately he passed away in, in the early eighties. Um, you know, and that that kind of pretty much ended the Cars uh, as a band. I think you know they they had some. They got after this album, they had another album, and they, they were really big on MTV and stuff. But um, was still mid '80s, I think. Ben, Benjamin Orr passed away. I'm not sure exactly when. We might be able to find out. Let's see. It says Candio is a second studio album by the American rock band The Cars. It was released in 1979 on Elector Records, featuring the top 20 hit "Let's Go." And the minor hit, it's all uh, all I can do. The album charted 15 places higher than its predecessor on the U.S. Billboard uh, at number three, and their debut peaked at number 18. Yeah, even though I mean I kind of like their debut better, um, frankly, but this still it was a great album, and it did better than their first album, but uh, s certainly was. Uh, certainly was successful it says unlike the first album candio was created under more uh a more uh democratic approach rico Kasich said of this uh when one of the songs goes to the band uh in its barest cassette form we sit around and talk about it <laughs> if i'm outvoted we just don't do it we almost didn't include double life on the new album uh, it had been dropped, and I think everybody in the cars is open-minded and creative enough that they would do anything. See, nobody's holding back anything back. Yeah, so super cool album. And uh, you know, I guess when it comes to picking songs you want to do as a band, you got to be a little bit democratic, unless you you are the man. I mean, that's that's what happened. That's what ruined Creedence Clearwater Revival was a, a democratic approach, you know. <laughs> so, so um, you got Rick Ocasek on the rhythm guitar and lead vocals, Elliot Easton, lead guitar, backing vocals, Greg Hawks, keyboard, saxophone, percussion, backing vocals, Benjamin Orr, great lead vocalist um, and bass guitarist, and David Robinson on the drums. Very cool. That's the cars. Uh, it's funny because, you know, I also do interviews with musicians on my channel here on All Music, and, uh, you know, they're not famous musicians, but... Uh, there are people that are very talented musicians and have amazing abilities, uh, musical abilities and have albums and, and they're incredibly, incredibly talented. And, um, but it doesn't mean I don't reach out to some of the more, uh, famous people. Um, you know, if you don't ask, you don't get it. And I actually reached out to, uh, Elliot Easton, the guitar player of the cars, uh, last week to see if he'd be interested in, uh, doing a, interview on uh, my channel on uh, and uh he was i did it on facebook it was probably inappropriate because i didn't go through the you know powers that be i just went straight to his facebook and i've been a facebook friend of his for years and uh you know he i'll respond on some of his stuff and he'll like my responses and stuff like that but um he he was very kind in his uh his decline of my offer so that was kind of fun though um, that he actually responded and uh, was very sweet about it. He said he was putting together his own YouTube channel, so he didn't want to, like, do somebody else's right now. And so I wished him luck, and I was pretty happy that he actually returned my request, even though it was a decline. It was very kind of him. All right. Dang, man, here we are. We are at uh, number two already for 1979. Let's see what we got here for number two. Got any guesses at all? Any guesses? I'm kind of giving it away with all these, aren't I? Here it is. Pink Floyd The Wall. Yeah, my number two, Pink Floyd The Wall. Great double album. 
it was a it was a it was an album that took me a while to kind of get into you know at first i was like well this is a lot different than some of their other albums you know like you know, through the outdoor and animals but uh over time it really really sort of cemented its place in i think uh pink floyd history as a very good album and even in rock and roll history this ranks itself pretty high i think as one of the best albums and rock and roll, especially for a 70s album. Um, got a lot of songs here because it was a double album. You got In the Flesh, Thin Ice, Another Brick in the Wall Part 1, The Happiest Days of Our Lives, Another Brick in the Wall 2, Mother, Goodbye Blue Sky, Empty Spaces, Young Lust, One, uh, one, of, my, uh, one of My Turns, Don't Leave Me Now, Another Brick in the Wall Part 3, and Goodbye Cruel World, 13 songs on one side. Then you got the next album, well, I guess not one side, but one album. Then the next album is Hey You, uh, Is There Anybody Out There, Nobody's Home, Vera, Bring the Boys Back Home, the freaking classic Comfortably Numb with one of the best guitar solos in history on it, in my opinion. The Show Must Go On by David Gilmore, by the way. In the Flesh, Run Like Hell, Waiting for the Worms, and Stop. Um, fantastic album. I mean, this is just a classic, classic uh rock and roll album but also pink floyd album um i think that uh it was soon after this that uh, roger waters left the band i think they did one more the final cut let's see what uh see what wikipedia has to say the wall is the 11th studio album by the english rock and roll band pink floyd released november 30th 1979 it's a rock opera that explores pink a jaded rock star whose eventual self-imposed isolation from society is symbolized by the wall. The album was a commercial success, topping the U.S. charts for 15 weeks and reached number three in the U.K. It initially received mixed reviews from critics, many of whom found it overblown and pretentious, but later it came to be considered as one of the greatest albums of all time. I kind of found it, I wouldn't say overblown and pretentious, but I just found it a little harder to it wasn't as accessible at first um you know i found you know like comfortably numb and another brick in the wall to be you know accessible but to wrap my mind around the concept of what this album was took a little longer to sort of understand it and over the years it, it really developed and has become one of my all-time favorites uh let's see the bassist roger waters conceived the wall during pink floyd's 1977 in the flesh tour um, modeling the character of Pink after himself and former bandmate Sid Barrett. Recording spanned uh, from December 78 to November 79, produced by Bob Ezrin, and he helped to refine the concept and bridge tensions between or during recording as the band were struggling with personal and financial issues at the time. Yeah, so they, they already were having personal issues. And to compound that, it's so sad that they were having financial issues too. It's like all these cr creative people that just can't make money from their work and everybody else makes money from their work. You know, you think about today where with streaming and the way you just don't make money like you used to, but you didn't make money then either. People, you know, all the corporations and, and they still take all the money and the creators are left with nothing. Um, especially when you're young and you're first starting, you're not, you don't know business and you can't, you don't know how to, you know, sign a contract or write a contract. You're just happy to have somebody, you know, record you. And, uh, yeah, it's crazy. And it was like that back then. And it was like that, like that earlier. And it's still like that now, you know, we just consume music in a different way. Okay, so let's see. The Wall is the last album to feature Pink Floyd as a quartet. Uh, keyboardist Richard Wright was fired by Waters during production, but stayed on as a salaried musician. See, that's just part of their you know dysfunction as a band. That's just ridiculous. Three singles were issued from the album, Another Brick in the Wall, Part 2. The band's only U.S. number one single, Run Like Hell and Comfortably Numb, both awesome songs. From 1980 to 1981, Pink Floyd prefer, performed the full album on a tour that featured elaborate theatrical effects. It certainly did. Yeah, so you got, and there's so much more about Pink Floyd The Wall. Um, but you got Roger Waters on vocals and bass guitar and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, 
David Gilmore, vocals, electric guitar, acoustic guitars, bass guitar, synthesizers, clavinet, percussions, Nick Mason, drums and percussion, and Rick White, Rick Wright, acoustic and electric pianos, Hammond organ, synthesizers, clavinets, and bass pedals. Yeah, super great album. Um, I, I don't think it's my favorite Pink Floyd album, but it's definitely uh, one of my favorite all-time albums, you know, for sure. Um, I don't think there's any way I can deny that, but uh, it was my number number two pick for 1979, which leaves us to number one. And uh, I wonder if anybody's got any guesses on what number one. If you were looking at my Spotify pictures there of the album covers, if you recognized anything that you might think was number one. But my number one for 1979, and this might be a little bit of a surprise to people. I don't know. Led Zeppelin, In Through the Outdoor. I really love this album, um, and I rank it really high in their, you know, discography and their in their total career. I rank it high. A lot of people don't, um, but I really do, and I like it a lot. And um, it's different, though, you know, and you can hear the differences. And from what I remember back in the day, um, this album was primarily written by uh, John Paul Jones, the bass player and keyboard player, and uh, Robert Plant. And John Bonham was struggling, and, and Jimmy Page was struggling, and w they just weren't showing up to the sessions. And so that's, I think, a big part of why this album sounds a little bit different, but it doesn't sound, it sounds great to me. I love it because I've always loved Robert Plant, and I've always loved John Paul Jones. I mean, you think back to previous albums of the keyboard work that John Paul Jones did in Led Zeppelin. I mean, it's it's crucial to some of those songs that were so amazing. Without that keyboard part, those songs wouldn't be good, you know. And his keyboard work in this is all over. It's all over this album, and it's very keyboard heavy. Um, I, I think that John... Bonham and and um, and Jimmy Page did great, and they have a lot of uh, a lot to be proud of here in the work that they did. But I just don't think they were their heads were all together during this time. But I think that uh, it was cool that John Paul Jones and Robert Plant could pull this off and write these songs and, and uh, produce an album that I really enjoy. In the evening is an amazing song, and I actually recently saw a YouTube video of. A concert that was much later than when this was was out because John Paul John Bonham was already gone. He he had passed away just relatively soon after this album was released. But it was a Page and Plant concert, and they had a full orchestra uh, with them on stage live, and they did a version of the song. It'd be worth looking up and checking out. I re highly recommend it. Amazing version of this song in the evening. Incredible. You got Southbound Soiree, you got Fool in the Rain, super fun song. You got Hot Dog, oh, Hot Dog. Carousel Lombra is a great song, 10 minutes and 32 seconds. That keyboard, and All of My Love, All of My Love, so good. And I'm Gonna Crawl, a fantastic song. Just real, just like kind of slow and plodding and amazing. Uh, and then it speeds up. Oh gosh, it's so good. This is a great album. I love it. One of my one of my favorite albums. Obviously, my favorite album, 1979, and I hold it real high in the catalog of Led Zeppelin. I really do, and I like it really probably better than some of like their, you know, some of their other albums. I like them better. Um, it's hard to say because I like all their albums, but I mean, if you compare In Through the Outdoor with Led Zeppelin one and two, it's almost like a completely different band. You know, I mean, it's very different music. I mean, they were playing blues music and a lot of blues music that they just kind of ripped off from, from like blues artists back in the day, um, or, or borrowed from or whatever you want to call it. But, um, which a lot of people have and done, have, have done, I mean, blues had a huge influence on rock and roll and people did that all the time. You can hear blues records from ZZ Top or from just anybody and you hear similar riffs uh, all the time and then they just put a different spin on it, you know, uh, but you know, that's like a Muddy Waters riff or, or, you know, uh, Junior Wells or somebody like that, you know, and it just sounds like that, but that's kind of common, pretty common. Uh, 
I, I know uh, somebody that doesn't like Led Zeppelin and he, and, and he says as a uh, kind of a put down to Led Zeppelin that they're the best cover band in rock and roll, which um, I tend to agree with. I, I do believe that, but I also believe they're one of the best original rock and, ba rock and roll bands, uh, you know, as well. They do both what very well. They take covers and they make them their own, and they also write original uh, songs that are amazing as well. And love this album. So, In Through the Outdoor is the eighth and final album, uh, studio album by the English rock band Led Zeppelin. It was recorded over a three week period in November and December in 1978 at the ABBA uh, at ABBA's Polar Studio in Stockholm, Sweden, and released by Swan Song. April 15th, 1979. That's crazy that it only took him three weeks to uh, record this album. In 1980, Led Zeppelin disbanded following the death of drummer John Bonham. Their release became a huge commercial success, particularly in the United States, sitting at number one slot on the Billboard charts in just the second week on the charts. And Through the Outdoor was the band's eighth and final studio release to, re uh, to reach the top of the charts in America. Yeah, they had some other albums out like Coda, which was a lot of uh, outtakes from other albums and probably this one and, and other previous albums. Um, the The album was named by the group to describe its recent struggles amidst the death of Robert Plant's son Carrick in 1977 and the taxation exile the band took from the UK. Let's see, the exile resulted in the band being unable to tour on British soil for over two years and trying to get back into the public mind was therefore like trying to get in through the outdoor. Yeah, so uh, the group began to rehearse material in 1978, and after six weeks, they were ready to record material. The group traveled to the Polar Studios in Stockholm, Sweden to begin, re begin recording. In contrast, okay, this is kind of what I was saying. In contrast to previous Led Zeppelin albums, In Through the Outdoor features much greater influence on the part of bassist and keyboard player John Paul Jones and vocalist Robert Plant. Um, yeah, see, I already heard this way back in the day, and um, and it shows in the in the recording too as well. So this kind of confirms that. Um, and relatively less from dr drummer John Bonham and guitarist Jimmy Page. The diminished input by Page and Bonham is attributed to the two band members often not showing up on time at the recording studio with Bonham struggling with alcoholism and Page battling heroin addiction. Jones later said there were two distinct camps by then. It was uh, Plant and I. This is John Paul Jones speaking, where we were uh, we're in the relatively they were relatively clean he's saying relatively uh, many of the songs were uh, consequently put together by plant and jones during the day while page and bonham added their parts late at night jones had also been inspired to create new material after purchasing a yamaha gx1 synthesizer prior to the album's recording so he was working closely with robert plant which was something that had not happened before well, it's a good thing it happened now because that was their last opportunity, basically. Following the recording sessions at Polar, the album was mixed at Page's personal studio in his home in Plumpton. Uh, Wearing and Tearing and Ozo Baby and Darling were recorded during the sessions for this album as well, but they were dropped uh, because of space constrictions on the LP format. And th those, all, all those songs actually appeared on the Coda album, which was an album I didn't really like when I first heard it. Um, but I recently went back and listened to it a few times uh, recently, and I was surprised at how many of the songs I actually knew and liked. And it was it's actually a good album. A friend of mine said, no, I love that album. And I was like, really? Because when I first heard it, I didn't like it. But uh, it's a great album, too. But this is my favorite of 1979. So personnel in Led Zeppelin was obviously John Bonham on drums and percussion, John Paul Jones on bass, guitar, and keyboards, and Jimmy Page, guitar, I don't know what a Gizmotron is, but Jimmy Page, Jimmy Page played it, um, and he also was uh, credited with production. And then you got Robert Plant um, with lead vocals. So, um, yeah, In Through the Outdoor is my number one pick for 1979 on this special edition top ten. Uh, it was a pretty good one. It was kind of hard, um, really, to to choose. Um, 
out of all of the competition because you got other bands that released some very notable records and some of these bands it was their best records they ever released um you got like the clash london calling um i'm not saying all these were the band's best but you got also tusk uh from fleetwood mac uh rust never sleeps from uh um neil young you even got michael jackson off the wall you know his kind of first solo release after kind of wanting to be different from um the jackson five uh you got the eagles long run you got the knack remember the knack came out with my sharona in 1979 and that album was crazy fun super fun album i love that album i played it all the time you got uh, discovery by electric light orchestra joy division unknown pleasures van halen 2 came out um you got the spirit of flow have spirits have flown by the bgs and highway to hell by acdc is a great album love it that's a that's could be in my top 10 tomorrow you know definitely in my top 20 love that album i love big acdc fan um back to the a egg with paul mccartney you got thin lizzie black rose um just a lot you got pat benatar you know in the heat of the night that's a huge album super great album love that album really really great neil gerardo on guitar just some fantastic guitar work loved it you got xtc uh, drums and wires came out oh let's see what else what else came out back then so there's just a lot of uh competition you know uh sticks cornerstone was a great album uh you got joe's garage from frank zappa you know i i was never really a huge fan of frank zappa but you know sure appreciate the musicianship that came from there a little quirky for me i like prog rock and stuff but i don't like quirky as much as i you know some people do um let's see if there's anything else that was notable uh you got van morrison ian hunter james taylor scorpions love drive i listen to that all the time too uh just a you know so you can see that it was a pretty oh desolation angels by uh bad company so yeah the competition stiff in 1979 there's a lot to choose from and i uh, did the best i could with my list i'm pretty pretty happy with it you know you got uh i'll read it down real quick you got number 10 uh is tom petty uh, damn the torpedoes you got a uh, foreigner head games number nine number eight is journey evolution the kinks slow budget number seven Number six is Super Tramp, Breakfast in America, Dire Straits, Communique is five. Four is the Police Regatta de Blanc, and three is the Cars Candio, two Pink Floyd the Wall, and Led Zeppelin. In Through the Outdoors, my number one in this top ten special edition. Super excited about that. And that's a good list. I like it. I'm gonna, I, I mean, I've listened to a lot of these actually recently. Um, that's, why, that's why they're on my list, I guess. So anyways, I want to uh, thank you very much. For sticking around we're approaching an hour and um, I'm happy that, uh, that that you're here and remember to you know uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel super huge and click that notification bell if you would please because without that notification bell it's almost like you're not subscribed because if you don't click it then you don't know that I'm releasing new videos and if you don't know I'm releasing new videos then you don't watch them and so it's you know a snowball effect of like not getting any views and it doesn't really help so subscribe and click the notification bell and then when you see one of my video then you'll see my videos and then you can watch it and I've got a lot of stuff coming up also um, uh, like I have interviews as you know and I'm interviewing different people and I've talked about it I've got also an, a new feature coming up where we're gonna uh, we're gonna uh, review albums as well and I've got a uh, Jeff Caston on on Saturdays we're gonna review uh, Asia by Steely Dan and we're gonna go through that and talk with Jeff about that album and that's gonna be a cool cool thing we're also gonna do a, a Zeppelin album not sure which one yet with uh, Tracy Longo and that's coming up soon and so look forward to that so but that's well that's why it's important to subscribe and to click that notification bell so you can see that one it'll pop up in your uh, in your feed when I post them also down in the description there are some other ways you can help support the channel if you like uh, check those I those out uh, check out that uh, life boost coffee that's really a good coffee and if you want to uh, get something and try it you get a uh, I got a discount code down there Todd 30 and you get a really steep discount off your first 
purchase uh, if you want to try it out and it helps out the channel to kind of help me keep going with this and it's no it doesn't cost you extra it's just what the cost is of the of the product and i get a little bit of money from that that helps out so and you get something for your money so that's cool but no worries uh these youtube uh videos are free and all you got to do is like subscribe click the notification bell and share share is super important too kind of boom spider webs and gets out there to more people so thank you very much that was 1979 our special edition top 10 and we're going to get started on the 80s and that's going to be a whole new world i think because now you're talking about heavy metal starting to come in <clears throat> hair metal and all that so it's going to be an interesting uh interesting decade for sure so uh let's say goodbye to the 70s and we are going to see you in the 80s we're going to start with 1980 and we'll see you there bye bye